My name is James Malcolm Cahoon, and I was known as Malcolm for through my public years, but later it became too long to say, so it got shortened to Mac. I was born on the northwest quarter of Section 23, Township 12, Range 26, west of the Third Meridian, just north of Maple Creek. I fit in as number four of six boys. I was born on the first day of March, 1917, when it was extremely cold and the doctor made a call at the proper time by horse and sleigh. I started driving the car when I was 11 and a half. On the farm, there was lots of places that it was useful. And so when I got to high school, there was nobody else, so I drove myself to school. I finished high school on uh, 25th of June, 1935. I was home on a farm on 1940. I think it was August that I enlisted. I guess I was expected to. I, I think that's the word, yeah. It was February 26th, and they referred me to number one Manning Depot in Toronto. I think everyone, when you first sign up, you think, well, it'll be good to be a pilot. In the front of my uh, logbook is written, stamped, uh, exceptional night vision. I could see things that nobody else could see in the room. It's long before I wore glasses. <laughs> so my job was strictly to uh, make sure we got to the target and got on the track to go home that was specified. Otherwise, you'd be a lone duck sitting way out in left field. Yeah, it's a long time since I've been here, so, uh, well, in 1999, so that's before this building was built. And uh, things have really changed around here. Yeah, these were all the same tools as we had. And uh, that square, it had centimeters and inches on it, and we'd make a dead reckoning map of the air plant. And then with an X, we'd put our position when it was determined. And then it was a matter to get the angle and the time, and we had the, the wind speed and direction up to that point. Oh, yeah, that's it, exactly. Only there's too many stripes on there. Mine just had two stripes. Otherwise, that's it. Yeah. It was right across the front from us in the other section. We knew what was going on, but we had our own project that was ready first. I guess it looks bigger when it's inside a building than outside. That's yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, the only part of it is we had the older one, the first before they went to the radio engines. It had the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. And, uh, but otherwise, it looks very, very nice, beautiful. I think about uh, crawling in the bottom, uh, getting ready to go on a trip. I guess they'd have to have a, a few stairs. 
Well, they've even got a bomb on there. Or a missile or something hung in the, in the bomb bay. There's where we went in. That looks higher than it was. But we had a, there was a ladder that they had on the, on the truck that took us out. We'd stand that ladder up and poke our stuff through the hole, our parachute, my, my kit for navigation, stuff that all in, and then uh, go up the ladder and uh, you get your hand inside and just crawl in, crawl in the hole. And that's, that's the hole I got sucked out of. This is the engineer's panel to look after all the watts, the temperatures of the engine and the fuel supply. And then the pilot seat right here. All his paraphernalia and the seat. So this was my hangout. This seat is folded up. This is different. This this really is a bigger table, and there's room for two seats there. It was just a single seat that went against the wall like that, and then the, 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 there's the there's the opening, and then they had the two guns at the front that he could operate. On the 27th of January, 43, we, uh, we got to the target all right, dropped our bombs, and was heading home straight west, and uh, about 20 miles west of Dusseldorf, we ran into some heaviest flak I've ever seen. Just, you could smell it in the air. <laughs> It smelled like uh, cordite. We were hit by artillery fire, and uh, inter intercom was dead. Uh, asked the bomb owner to go back and check out what was happening, or what the damage was. And uh, he came back and says, we gotta go right now. Now, I don't know where the plane went, what happened to them, but they all have no known grave. It was dark as blazes. It was a cloudy, hard to tell when you're getting down near the ground. All of a sudden, well, I lived in a plowed field. Couldn't have been better. <laughs> Made the order, I thought. So I just found a furrow and put my parachute in it so it wouldn't be a flag. <laughs> found the right star in the sky that I needed to go west and started. And walked all night uh, across fields and in crossing those fields I came to a railway and I walked along that for a long time and decided that I was going the wrong way. I didn't want to go south, I wanted to go west. So I decided I'd had to cross the railway. And it had a six foot fence with barbed wire on top. But I looked at it and I thought, well, I can climb that. So I got over and down the other side, and my foot on the one rail, and I was just about to step when I thought, my God, this is an electric railway. So I jumped instead with what I could and landed on the side, on the other rail. But it was that rail in the middle of it there might have been sparks. I was trying to get to the border of Holland. Of course, in January, the rivers had ice on them, but only a little bit, and you couldn't get across. And I had to walk until I found a bridge, and the darn bridge was guarded. 
I had to take a chance. Two days had gone by and all I had to eat was, well, I didn't have anything to eat. It was a, a frozen turnip that I tried. <laughs> and I thought, that's not good. I would to break my teeth and not have anything to eat either. So, so that, was the, that was all I had. And after two days, you get, that's about as far as you can go, you know. They caught me and said, for you, the war is over. Because I had my uniform. I didn't have any other clothes. I don't know animosity. Uh, there was somebody who took me to uh, Cologne, it was. It was not so far away, and I spent the night in the jail there. I think I was there two nights. And the next day, I got a conducted tour on the railway along the Rhine River and saw all the castles and all the things that people pay big money to go and see. Right down to Frankfurt on Main. That's where the interrogation center. There you put, they put you in solitary confinement for two weeks. And they visit you about every day or they might let three days go in between. They want to know what, what signals we used and I said, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. After that interrogation center, we were sent to a camp off 521B, which was at Schuven, Poland. It was only there about two months, which is a thankful situation. And then they moved us to Sagan, and uh, that was home until January the 27th, same day I was shot down, 45. Our days were quite similar. There was a roll call in the morning where everybody had to get out of bed and get out there and get counted and make sure that they were all there. And we lined up in rows of three by hut number. In each hut, there were 12 rooms. And in each room, it varied from eight to 10, guarded start down, start ein, drei, frei, vier, fünf, <laughs> on the, down the road, ein, hundred, <laughs> whatever it was. So, it was time for breakfast, which was one slice of bread and some coffee that wasn't fit drinking, but we drank it anyway. It was a make-believe ersatz coffee of some kind. We also had some jam that was not fit to eat, but we got Red Cross parcels most time. And then that was uh, life flavor items. And there was, some, there was always a can of jam, quite often some butter, and uh, there might even be a chocolate or two. Oh, there was a can of Spam, a can of bully beef from Argentina, and a can of Klim, milk spelled backwards, which was good powdered milk. It was made in England. That was a lifesaver. The bread was, was made of, uh, well, first of all, it was about the size of a loaf you'd get, a one pound loaf, but it weighed four pounds. And that was a ration for one man for one week. So we got pretty ac accurate of, of dividing it. Uh, notch here for half, and then, then you could figure pretty even slices to get the right number of slices for seven days. So we weren't going to overeat one day and starve the next. It was well known that our duty was to escape if we could. And I felt that if we could devise a plan and, and pull it off, well then it gave us something to do and we're doing something we we're supposed to be doing. The camp was all up on stilts so they could see under and it was difficult to start a hole. 
The Great Escape wasn't until March 44. The Wooden Horse came first, and it must have been about November 43 that that was completed. The plan was that they build this exercise horse that would get placed in a in a position that you could go back to. So without question, set it exactly in the same spot. If we kept exercising on it every day and kept it in use. And uh, so they finally accepted it. That's the way we wanted it. And they weren't doing any harm, so they just let us go ahead. So that's when they started. When the horse got carried out, there was one or two men out and the tools for digging. They had a trap made, and one day somebody went out in the thing, put it down to, while they were, everybody was exercising on. He dug away the dirt, buried the trap, got it all, brushed the sand over it again, and uh, everything looked just right. And uh, the next day, same thing would happen, only in bags, and they'd start digging to fill bags, and, and f kept filling those, hung it up on hooks in our, in our wooden horse, and then had our eight strong men at the right time, put, slipped the two by fours in, the two men on each side, two, four, six, eight, and could pick it up with the man inside and sand. The three men that were going to go out were, were salesmen who visited Germany on a regular basis, you know, every couple of weeks or something. And they knew everywhere in Germany and they spoke German perfectly. My department was dispersal because it was yellow sand and it was just like setting off an alarm bell if that were seen on the ground. Got the bags from pants that were worn out. They made good ones because you could cut the seam and lay those so you get two bags out of a pant about that big round. One that would slide down in your leg and hook on a, on a, on a piece of suspender type of thing that, that hang here so you could hook it right on there and so it would hang down to almost your ankle and uh, had a string on the end where you could feed it through into a pocket so you could reach in your pocket and pull the string and make it dribble sand. So that's what they did every morning and sometimes at noon. So actually we did get the three out and all three got home. The escape from prison camps is no longer a sport. <laughs> yes, that showed up right after the 50 were shot. We knew there had been a big escape and, and they had they had 250 ready to go. Of the 76, three got home, 50 were shot trying to escape. The other 23, they didn't bring them to our camp, sent them to other high security places that we didn't know about. So we decided, even though we had another hole dug ready to go, we never used it. And that was one that nobody knows about. This jerk comes in and says, Rouse. <laughs> Tonight. And uh, so we all were scratching around, what in the dickens can we do? We could hear the Russian army coming, we would hear the artillery. And, and we never had the thought that what the Russians would surround us, you know, and just ignore us, keep on going. <laughs> it 
It was about 25 below zero when we left. And I tell you, it was cold. And we weren't prepared for that. I had my fine boots. They were the first thing to go on. And my white sweater. I used it as a pillow all the time I was in there. And didn't have much for mitts, but I had something. A train picked us up on each car and said, eight horses or 40 men. And they were the ones that hauled the Jews to the concentration camps. And uh, so they just stuffed us full with the guard pushing people in until they couldn't push anymore. Took us to the northwest corner of Germany, up by Bremen, somewhere in there, into a camp, and we stayed there for two months. And early in April, the Allies crossed the Rhine. We were on the road again, going east. So we walked cobblestone roads right through uh, Hamburg on the outskirts. And what a shock that was to see. Blocks and blocks of houses, the roofs all burned off, burned out inside, just the, the, the cement walls standing. Not a sign of life. Right through Hamburg to Lubeck. The Russians were on that side, Americans and the British in the north. So we were in that last little page. So on May the May the 3rd, that's when they declared the war was over. Hitler was dead. It took us about three days to figure out a plan. Are we gonna sit here and wait for them to come and get us in a month? Or are we gonna see if we can get home? So we, we decided, let's go home, we had enough. There were five of us that were traveling together. Two of them said, well, we'll find transportation. That's wonderful. I said, I'll drive it. Nice little car, road map in the glove compartment. The autobahn was just a few miles south of Lubeck. There was nobody on it. We drove to Hanover Airport, and the guard at the gate wondered, what, what's he going to do with us? I said, well, Here's a plan. We don't have money to buy tickets, but we have a car of questionable ownership. And there's the keys. And he called the helper and he said, take these fellows and put them on the next plane out. We were in England by dark, not far from London where we got new shoes. I'd worn the flying boots out, so I hung them on a fence post somewhere east of uh, Hamburg, but never went back to get them. The next morning, we took a train to London. We were posted to Bournemouth to fatten us up a little bit. We couldn't eat very much. Stomach was full <laughs> pretty quick. And we went to Piccadilly and spent the afternoon. The biggest crowd of people I ever saw in my life. I stayed at the Strand Palace Hotel and the Louis Pasteur. We're home to Halifax and there's a train waiting and took us to Montreal where it was a dispersal point and we were there on June the 10th. Memories have a habit of showing up when you see things the way it used to be. Oh, this is a monument that was built after the end of the war. Some people went over there from England and built that, and it's still there, outside where the camp was. Apparently the camp is demolished and uh, something else there now.
Welcome to you all. Bienvenue à tous. Warrant officer Sagan, release the pigeon.